You're done with your Oreo? <laughs> yeah, done with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? Really the brother did. did. The brother, that's what I thought too. Yeah. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Yeah. Do you just want to talk, talk about death? death? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm just a murdery thingy 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 yeah, the price is wrong, bitch. What's that from? Happy Gilmore. Find your happy place. You know, Adam Sandler. Get 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 in the hole. That's your home. Why did you, you don't want to go to your home? Welcome to Mystery Murdery Thingy. My name's Chloe. My name's Mario. That was amazing. Thank you. <coughs> this is the podcast where we talk about Adam Sandler movies. What's your favorite Adam Sandler movie? Anger Management. Good. I also good love choice. Jack Nicholson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he and is And I good. love um, oh, that fucking song that they sing. I don't know. I've, I've only seen that movie like once. I think, oh, what's my favorite Adam Sandler movie? Oh, there are so many. Um, what's the one where he goes back to school? The one that's really stupid and it's got like... Isn't that Happy Gilmore? Oh, no, that's the golfing one, right? Yeah, Happy Gilmore's the golf. That one's good, too. Mr. Deeds is good. I, don't, I like Adam Sandler movies. Back to school, back to school, <laughs> to show my dad I'm no fool. Isn't that what he says? I'm not a fool. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. What is that movie? I don't know. We should actually start talking about our thing, though, because we don't have, like, that much time. Right. Because uh, I have to get to rehearsal for the Mario's showman. Mario's doing theater things. Communityplayers.org. Go in there. You, you'll see what I'm doing. I'm also doing theater things. It's the things. wedding singer. We're theater people. Ugh. I know we've said that a few times, but, like, yeah, we're, we're basically just theater people. That's it. It's true. Yep. Oh, I, I do not want to forget. Oh, my God. I almost forgot. We got our second Patreon subscriber. We did. Thank and you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much, Emma. We stand. Right? We stand both of our... Uh, is that, did I use it right? Both yes. of our um, Patreon subscribers? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm very old. Stan um, is a verb and a noun. Nope, that, see, I think you got it wrong. Stan is a character on South Park. God damn it. That's the only use of that word. Um, <sighs> thank you, Matt and Trey. So anyway, oh, no. I just wanted to not forget to shout out our Patreon subscriber, Emma. Thank you so much. You can get a shout out, too, if you donate a dollar. Donate us a dollar, and you can get a shout out. Um, It'll be super cool. Follow also, us on all of the social media. All of them. Facebook, Twitter, Insta. Instagram. Um, oh, I put up a... Um, I think I put it on our Patreon, too. A poster, um, which has some bitlies um, with some, for some quick links into our different bullshits. And, oh, uh, I have a, my Twitter. I'm Send me active on, at MarioTex30, so at me. I'm not going to give out my Twitter. You have to find it. <laughs> no, I want you to tw- tweeter me. Tweeter me. Because I don't use my no, Twitter. My, my Twitter. If people not tweeter me, that would be super cool. My Twitter's not hard to find, but I'm not going to I'm easy to find, out. at MarioTex30. Um, yeah, Twitter. I was going to say something, but I don't remember what okay, it is. Okay, cool. Um, I also was going to say something, but I don't remember what it yeah! is. Yeah! It's a mystery. <laughs> Good job, team mystery. <laughs> so thanks, you guys, for, li- for listening. You know, we always appreciate it. Oh, um, I haven't told you this yet. Oh. I think uh, this weekend we are going to start our new yes. Patreon that's what um, I was going to say, too. Episode. Yes. You're going to say the same thing? Great. It's going to be for all of our, all of our subscribers. Right. It, a dollar, Emma, Michelle. What is her name, right, Michelle? I believe. Okay, good. I hope I got that right. Michelle and Emma, you're going to get it. So we're going to start and tell them what it is. Sorry, what? Sorry, tell I, them what I, it's I zoned be. out for a real quick sec. That's cool, cool. That happens? Tell them what it's going to be. Okay, so Mario and I are basically going to start... <laughs> <laughs> Is that just suggested by my roommate? Yeah. Uh, we're going to get hammered. Come drink with us. Um, we're going to make a nice, cute little cocktail. Come drink with us. That's what we should call it. Come that. drink with us. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to talk about anything. I Any, think we should, Anything, it's, everything. It's definitely going to be more murder in general. We're going to talk about things that are not mysteries, generally. But yeah. we'll also talk about the news, pop culture. Right, right. Our lives, maybe... I don't know. We'll, what we'll, we'll drink a little bit. So who knows what the fuck we'll talk who, about? I mean, it's <gasps> it can a be mystery. Anything. It's a mystery. I thought you would have said it with me at the same time. I thought we had a good vibe going. Nope. Don't have ESP. <laughs> uh, nope. That's not real. Or is it? It's a. It's mystery. a mystery. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
Okay, so we haven't actually decided. Am I going to go first or are you going to oh, go Oh, shit. First? I completely forgot. Should we do work, paper, scissors? Okay. Okay. One, Rock, two, paper, three, scissors, shoot. shoot. Rock, Rock, paper, paper scissors, scissors, shoot. Yes. Okay, you go first. That means I'm going first. <laughs> so I actually am really excited to get into this. Uh-huh. Um, why do we dream? I don't know. Why do we dream? That's what I'm talking about today. Cool. Good. Okay. Good topic. I'm talking about This dreams. is something I've definitely thought. I think everyone is like wondered about this. Right? This is like a, it's one of those like universal mysteries. Exactly. And that's kind of what I wanted to to focus on. So, you're doing a two-parter and I'm going to do a two-parter too. Cool. So, I think we're mostly going to have like a basic discussion on the functions of dreams and like people's theories cuz we don't no, don't read. You're not, I'm not allowed to read. <laughs> but we're we're just discussing. So, I'm going to keep my um, glasses on. Okay. <laughs> um and and like uh the theories right. of like why we dream. It's gonna kind of be like a survey of the theories about why we dream. Right. Okay. And then in part two, I think I'm gonna focus more on sleep mm-hmm. and the mystery of sleep and also get more into um dream interpretation okay. and lucid dreaming. Nice. Which I've only done once. Have you ever done it? I remember having done it, yes, but a I've heard, I don't know if you, I did it by heard, if you read this, I didn't do it on purpose. that it's more prevalent when you're younger. Is that true? That makes a lot of sense. I've, I think I've heard that somewhere before. That's my source. Because I didn't do research for your topic, so. <laughs> um, but I, that makes sense. Uh-huh. Yeah, because the, the, the youthful mind is kind of more plastic or growing. It's kind of like changing more. I don't know. Well, so why do we dream? It's not like... I don't know. It's not an easy question. And like I said, we don't know the basic function of dreaming and we don't really know the purpose of sleep either or the functions of rapid eye movement, REM. Um, and some people have kind of like a boring look at it and say dreams are have no function. They're just there. Like that it used to have a function, but now it doesn't? Like our no, like vestigial tails or something? It just doesn't. Okay. It's just like a consequence of how it's nature works. It's a consequence. Right, right. But it doesn't have like... I don't know. I find that implausible because the brain always seems to like find a function for everything. Right. Even if there wasn't one at the beginning. you know, it, Yeah. It, and it changes the functions of different things. I don't know. That just seems unlikely. Yeah. Our brains are changing all the time. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty, pretty key. That's a mystery in and of itself. The brain. I feel like oh, that's yeah. too much. That's a huge mystery. Ooh, I don't want to talk about. Well, we talked about reality, so I feel like if we're gonna, if we no, tackle we'll, reality, we can do the brain. Oh yeah, no, we we do, we'll definitely do it at some point, but not like soon or anything. Probably not soon. <laughs> it's not on the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> but we never fucking know what we're gonna do from week to week. So who knows? Accurate. So, um, I got this theory from. Uh, Scientific American, the contemporary theory of dreaming. So basically says that the activation patterns in your brain are always shifting and connections are being made. Uh, They're being made, they're being even unmade. And Mm that's stuff like that's happening constantly. Mm -hmm. And that like was forming the physical basis of our minds. And so there's kind of like a continuum. So of like... um, focus and like activity so at, at one end of this like continuum is is focused waking activity like like doing math or playing sports making um, a podcast right right um so when we're focused and linear and on a train of thought what well, well bounded at the other end is totally less focused like daydreaming um reverie stuff like that mm-hmm. um it's more image based and connections are made most loosely and they're um, made most loosely when we dream. Mm. So it's kind of this end and that end and dreaming is when we're just less, less focused. And some say that it, it's, it's random. And if that's the case, then dreams are meaningless, right? Right. Right. This is basically the hypothesis that it's like a ran- it's like a random access memory. It's just yeah. like pulling up random memories that were like recently formed because those are the ones that are available. But and then just like it's it's just putting them together randomly. There's no like sense to it or 
reason why dreams are the way they are. It's it's kind of a, a nihilistic view of dreams, I suppose. Yeah. This theory also looks at um, your emotions, and it says that your dreams are actually, they stem from and are guided by your emotions. So when a, when your emotion is, is clear, that's when you tend to have clearer and more linear type dreams. Hmm. And when there's more emotions, like the more emotions that are, are involved and uh, the more complicated maybe a situation in your life is that's causing these emotions, um, the more complicated and more weird the dream is. Yeah, I don't know. I like that theory. Yeah. I feel like it makes a lot of sense. Because if if you were to look at dream interpretation as a solid concept, which it's it's not... <laughs> I yeah, mean, and you're going to talk about that more in the second episode, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but if you're if you were going to look at it uh-huh. at it that way, that's how it would be. And it makes sense with the sort of random access memory uh, hypothesis as well, because it's like, well, whatever you've been thinking about during the day, that's what's going to be there for your dreams to be made of. So if it's more complicated, it'll be more complicated. If it's right, simpler, it'll be simpler. If it's happier, it's et cetera, et cetera. It's when you right? get like the the type of dreams where you're you're you feel like you're in two places at once, or like yeah, my mom was there, but she was she was like wearing she was like she had like a beard or something. Someone was there, like that. but you couldn't reach them, or yeah, you were trying yeah. to talk to them, but they couldn't hear you. Yeah. Or was those dreams you had when you were a kid, where like something was like following you, but you didn't know what it was? Right, right. Ooh, that sounds like anxiety. That's what mm-hmm. that sounds like. Yeah, I mean, there are some dreams that have, I think, a clear interpretation that seems, like, obvious. Yeah. And then, but that's only a small number of them, right? Um, I think so. Right. I, I mean, so we can't it, really, I, it's not, it's, you can't really answer that question. Right. I mean, has but, anyone done, like, a scientific study of the contents of dreams? The contents of, I'll look into that. I don't that's know. That's a good question. Probably not. I have never heard of any such thing. I should look at some studies. If there's been, like, an actual, like, rigorous scientific study. Let's, like, of look, like at, look at maybe a hundred people's different dream journals. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Ooh. Interesting. I wonder what would emerge. Ooh. Now, those are some... <laughs> qu- oh, ooh, ooh. I'm intrigued. <laughs> mysteries, mysteries. I'm intrigued. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. Those are the kind of dreams that I have sometimes. Like, the ones where it's, like, you're in one place and all of a sudden you're, like... It, totally someplace else and mm-hmm. another person sh- like just pops up it's have you ever died in a dream they say that yes. it's not supposed to be possible right no i've but definitely died i definitely in a have dream. and then had like a little afterlife i remember that i was like a little ghost for a little while no i, I don't i don't feel like i ever had that an afterlife me. i just had like a an oh my god i'm dead <laughs> yeah <laughs> like doom like doom yeah is that weird Ooh. I remember having a certain dream where I had like a, and I don't remember my dreams, you know, consistently. Right, but we've talked about this before. Like Mario and I have I had this conversation many we've times. We've talked about dreams quite a bit, um, where I just had this sense of like overwhelming existential dread. Yeah. You know, just like in my dream, like laying in bed. And it was one of those dreams where you don't realize you're dreaming because it's all completely normal. And just like it would be, like you're laying in bed and it's dark. And you're in your bed, and it's not, like but you're actually chills. dreaming. Oh my, like getting uh, chills! Oh my god! And then Freddy Krueger comes in the ah, room. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> <laughs> you know I hate that you, shit. You hate horror movies. You've never seen Freddy. No, I'm gonna 13. have a dream about because that's scary. Oh wait, no. Scary. Which one is he in? Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street. That's so scary. It is scary. I know. Oh and dr- but it's weird how dreams can be very scary, even though there's no actual harm involved. Like, right. your brain tricks itself, you know, right. taking it back to kind of, like, that Im- emotional connection, right, to, to dreams. And they're, cr- like, created by emotions. Like, how can your brain make itself think it's in mortal danger when you're just laying there immobile, basically? Right, right. Well... Isn't that... On, a, that's on, kind of a mystery, right? Yeah. Well, on the, on, the, on the opposite side of that is that another theory is that dreams could possibly help us deal with mm. emotional trauma. I've heard of that. So if you can trick your brain in a way, it can possibly um, help you, help you, like, like mm-hmm. change you for, for better. Mm-hmm. So in the most basic of terms, imagery connects and, like, molds 
together, right? And then that gradually turns into something that's much more ordinary. So you could start with these like crazy um, emotions about about something like like um, being trapped in your house during like a fire, like a cl- you get a close call or something like or something like that, something mm-hmm. very scary like mm-hmm. that. You could have these like elevated emotions at first and like dream about them, but then eventually time passes and you'll have other emotions mm-hmm. and they'll kind of mix and mold together mm-hmm. until you have something that's much less traumatic. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense because if you know, and I've learned a little bit about how the brain works, right? I mean, it's such a vast thing, right? Like we said, a whole set of episodes in and of itself. But the the brain, in its essence, is a a memory and prediction machine. That's what it's yeah. doing all the time, every single moment of the day. Even though we're mostly not aware of it, it's anticipating what it thinks is about to happen. And then it's saying, "Did that just happen?" Oh, and if so it did, weird. everything's fine. You're not aware. And if it's not, then it brings it to your conscious brain. Where we're talking about that highest, that uh, you know, one side of the spectrum level, where you're, you're right, consciously right, right, right. aware of what's of what's occurring. Um, and what dreams may be is like, do it's doing that right? It's making predictions about what may happen in the future, presenting that to you as a dream scenario, right? Testing different reactions and possible scenarios, and then subconsciously storing that information so that your brain can use it later in case those scenarios possibly occur. Exactly. Which uh, is such a crazy idea, but it seems like it's it's pretty plausible. Well, stemming off of that, another scenario, which I also think is very plausible, is that your dreams are there, for, is like... um like a trial, like a practice. Like, I'm mm-hmm. going to throw some kind of, like, danger at you and you're going to have to fucking react and we're going to, like... And you act that out through, through your dreams. Right. And I was like, that's very, very interesting. I don't know. Yeah. I thought that was the most interesting. Let me see if I, I find... I find that idea very compelling. Okay, so... It's from... Um, it, it's based... Um, this cognitive neuroscientist... Um, Anti Revon Suo of Sweden's University of Skovde. I didn't look how, cool. how to spell that. <laughs> or uh, how, to, how, to, how to say or it. It's got one of those little weird, like, it O's over the A or no, whatever. No, it's an umlaut. Oh, it's just an umlaut, okay. Skov- Skovde. Skovde. He's, he's Swedish. Okay. And he's a cognitive neuroscientist. Cool. I'm sure he speaks perfect English. He probably does. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <laughs> there is a... He's probably like... 95% chance. or something. <laughs> that he can. Yeah. Uh, so he's proposed what he calls the threat simulation theory, arguing that the brain responds to potential future danger by running, like, fire drills, mm-hmm. basically, while we sleep, just to keep us on top of our game. Right. Right? right. I thought that's Without like, actually expelling energy. Right, right. I love that. That's a... No, I, I find that idea really convincing. I like it a lot. And a lot of the stuff we do anyway as humans, like, a lot of the explanations for the stuff we do is based on, like, pr- it's, like, primal. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if anything's going to be primal, it's going to be your dreams. Because across... It doesn't matter who you study, what wherever they grew up, nation, like, race, sexual, whatever... Dreams are dreams, and, and everybody's had um, that dream. Everybody knows what it's true. like. And to d- dream. don't uh, non-human animals dream too, or um, like uh, monkeys and elephant? Like I've, I thought that that had been like at least, if not definitively proven, like there were suggestions to that effect. I'm not. I'm not expecting you to answer this. I'm just. I'm just. I'm not I'm, sure. I seem yeah. to recall that. Well, I know that dogs definitely dream. There's no right. way my dog's not dreaming. That has to be what's going on. There's no other explanation for them, like, yip-yapping and, like, yeah. seeming like they're running after something. Like, clearly they're dreaming. My dog, like, she goes... And if dogs she, dream, like, then, she, like, like, growls, growls a little dreams. bit. She goes... Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And we're like, whoa, Mills! <laughs> so it must like, be <laughs> really primeval. You know, it's something that, like, a common ancestor hundreds of millions of years ago would have been dreaming. R- exactly. You know, so it's, it's clearly... It, and that's, again, why I think it has to have some kind of function, one would think, if it's so persistent through geolog- you know, through um, uh, evolutionary time. You know, usually things that persist through evolution have some kind of purpose, even if it is not the same purpose. that they- Usually it's not the same purpose they started with, actually. I think. I don't know. I'm not a fucking scientist. <laughs> it's I'll my own informed opinion. Well, I did I mean, some research. It's... I don't know. I feel like it's good to have 
I mean, obviously it's good to have, you know, scientific background and, <laughs> you know, um, an advanced understanding of both science and psychology and philosophy <laughs> right. when talking about these things. Right. But I also feel like as a normal person, since it's something that everybody experiences, True. you can talk about it and right. you can't be judged that harshly. <laughs> right, right. You know? Because it's like, well, I know dreams. Like, I've dreamed. I had right, a, dr- I had a right. dream uh, once. It's not you like know? we're talking about studying, like, microbiology. I can't, like, describe what it's like to look Or, like, I a- told you the other day, I was like, oh, I think I'm, I'm going to do, like, quantum physics, like, in a couple of weeks. And you're like, yeah, but are you? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I don't know. That is kind of, this kind of a lot to that. I mean, I've read about it, but I don't know. I just, is that really a, a little bit of I don't a stretch. A little yeah. bit of a stretch. Some things are a little, a little big. Anyway. I'm, I mean, if people are into it, then you should yeah. tweet at us. Quantum physics? I love it. Yes, I like no? It. Richard Feynman? Who? <laughs> I mean, that's what I was thinking. What? (laughs) So let's talk about Freud. Ooh, yeah. So he had a whole famous famous men. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) now you're pissed. (laughs) (laughs) Feminist Chloe was like, "We always talk about famous men. (laughs) Why we always got to talk about famous men?" But we're gonna talk about Freud (laughs) because he had, uh, he, uh, you know, he had some ideas. He had a lot of ideas about a lot of stuff. (laughs) That's basically what I wrote. So he thought that dreams showed our, like, deepest, darkest desires stemming from our unconscious unconscious mind. And so he was basically saying that we, we kind of, like, open up when we dream and our, like, true desires show through. And and for Freud, that was sex, 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 Mm -hmm. sex. All sex, nothing but sex. <laughs> yeah, it's this like idea of the the id and and the ego and the super ego, right? Right. Where, like right. the id is like obsessed with like sex and and eating and like these primal concerns, right? Yeah, and Freud's idea was that where that's where dreams stem stem from. Right. You kind of like revert to your id state when you dream. Yeah. I it's, I don't believe it. It doesn't. It seems kind of silly. I think now. I think that too because some. <laughs> Man, some dreams are weird. Like, right. they don't make any sense, and they're just bizarre. Like, what? what? <laughs> but uh, Freud also didn't, as great a man as he was, didn't have access to cognitive theory or the kind of neuroscience that, like, we have now over 100 years later, right? So we know that, like, when you dream, the part of your brain that uh, that um, perceives, like, the, the the logical connections between things is turned off. Yeah. And that's why things are completely illogical in dreams, but you don't perceive it to be illogical. Right. Because that part of your brain is not, like, functioning at that particular moment. Why is that? That's kind of a mystery. Yeah. Does that have to do with this notion of, like, testing out different theories or running these fire drills? The fire drills have to be, like, super implausible because, you know, that's just, like, you're testing all these weird theories, right? That's the whole point. I don't know. He also, his theories also stemmed um, more conversation about dream interpretation. Right. He, all of his and theories Carl kind Jung. of made that much more popular. Right. Jung was, was really into dream interpretation, wasn't he? I, I believe he was. So I also want to talk about a couple other theories. One is called the activation synthesis model. Um, it was first proposed by a uh, guy named J. Allen Hobson and Robert McClarley in 1977. So basically suggests that dreams are an interpretation of signals generated by the brain during sleep. So when your brain becomes active a- as you sleep, it causes areas of the limbic system like the amygdala and the hippocampus um, all of that becomes active. So that's where your emotions, sensations, memories, all of that, that's where all of that takes place. Mm-hmm. And so as as you're sleeping, those areas kind of like light up and your brain synthesizes that and interprets that and um, it attempts to find like meaning in, in these signals and that results in, in dreaming. So J. Allen Hobson quote, our most creative conscious state 
one in which the chaotic, spontaneous recombination of cognitive elements produces novel configurations of information, new ideas. While many or even most of these ideas may be nonsensical, if even a few of its fanciful products are truly useful, our dream time will not have been wasted. <laughs> it's, oh, how nice. I like that. <laughs> it's a very positive theory. <laughs> oh, uh, how nice. Oh, that's cool. Well, that's what I think. I think, too, I like, I like that theory. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just kind of, I don't know, it, it, it looks at it, in a more scientific way, but also places it in internal, like it's all in internal. Yeah. But, um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I have a couple more. Let me see. Yeah, keep going. Okay, okay. I thought, okay. Sorry, I like. <laughs> That's okay. have to like prepare myself sometimes. So dreams could also be a data dump. We dream to forget. Have you? Have you heard that before? I've, I think I've, I've heard that before. I don't know. We, so, I mean, I guess I've, I've heard about it in terms of, like, yeah, like, clean, cleaning up um, waste products in the brain and cleaning up, like, old memories and or things that aren't, weren't necessary from the day. Well, like, that reminds me of... Um, Inside Out. Inside Out, exactly! Oh, I was going to mention that, like, right at the beginning, and then I forgot, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I was going to say, see Inside Out for more information. Well, yeah, they did a good job talking about memory and how... Because they, they worked went with scientists. They into, like, the huge library. They're like, this is, this is mm-hmm. long-term memory. Right. And there was just... It was all there. Mm-hmm. But, Weird. yeah, the short-term, it was, like... It was like going down into the pit that yeah. looked dark and uh, like it had no bottom, but it actually did have a bottom, uh, which I guess is like memory too. Like even when it's like erased, it's like still there. But after a while, it's like, you know, then it goes Like a computer. Goes away. In, the, in that way, it is like a computer. In most ways, the brain is not like a digital computer, but yeah. In that way, it is. In that way, it, it kind of is, yeah. In some cases, it's not really... In, in a lot of, yeah, yeah. So even though we forget, like, 90% of them, it's mm-hmm. still beneficial to look back and, like, kind of analyze mm-hmm. them. So I guess it makes sense that it could be just some kind of, like... But then when you look back on it, you're like, oh, I guess I do need to get rid of all that baggage. And I, like, do need to, you know... Because I feel like sometimes your dreams can be inspirational. Yeah. Um, yeah, it should, it, and again, it's this idea of, like, possible worlds, right? It's exploring right. possible worlds. Next episode, I also want to touch on nightmares. Oh, yeah. Yes, that would be a good one. I feel like this kind of was more like an intro to dreams, and, okay. like, in in the next episode, we can focus on, like, the 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 core of them, and, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More like the purpose and stuff. Yes. <laughs> so, did you have like a favorite theory? Pro- mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you? What do you think? I mean, I definitely like the the theory that it's like you know the the forming these like fire drills. You know that it it developed from um, you know this this like ability to 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 plan in a more unstructured way, you know, like, um, and ex- experience these different possibilities, you know, that that's, that's definitely seems like a very useful concept for like higher cognitive, you know, um, organisms. Um, but it, I feel like we need to learn more about how the brain works, I guess, to really know for sure why, we don't even know why thoughts happen, why conscious thoughts happen, you know, yeah, really, yeah. like at its, at its basis. So exploring dreams seems like it's, it's like a little bit out of reach. But I think that's also why it's good, good mystery fodder because, I mean, it really is like a mystery, like, and something that's probably going to be a mystery for a long time. I know. Although it's there are good those, theories. It, it's one of those things that we can keep expanding on as we explore oh i also wanted to um speak speaking of exploring our unconscious and exploring dreams like in a more direct way i don't know if you've heard about this but the ability to image dreams is actually something that's possible now I don't what know do you, you like, mean like like you can do this like scientists have been able to use um brain waves you know because the the brain creates waves of, of energy that come off of it to 
um, reconstruct a rough image of an image that someone was dreaming about. They, they like trained this person to, um, basically lucid dream in a sense to create a certain image in their dream. Right. And they were doing, you know, in like a, basically like a MRI or whatever. Right. Um, they were, um, detecting the waves coming off their brain and were able to reconstruct with, with that information, what they were actually seeing in their, in their dream. In a very rough way. What? Yeah, you I can look it up. Un- I'm, I'm confused. They they thought of a certain image in their brain during while and they what, were dreaming. And what, it showed up on a screen? Yeah. So if I thought of a house, a house would show up on screen? But it wasn't a perfect image of a house. It, w- it was, you know, it, w- it had the, the outlines and, and the structure. But yeah, that was basically it. <gasps> What? Yeah. That's scary. <laughs> I mean, the the ability to like detect and feed sensory data into the brain, it's coming. It's gonna come at some point. Uh, I really believe that. Yeah. Yo, if the we, Matrix, it's it's not that implausible. Yo, if we weren't destroying the planet within the next couple hundred years, I bet you at some point we would be able to like put on glasses and like go to sleep and then like replay. Like, what we dreamed that night. Yeah, probably. Is that in Black Mirror? Like, that exact thing? Or am I just Well, they had, like, lenses where you could go back and look at stuff that's actually happened to right, you. Right, right. But not in dreams. Yeah, and, like, know. erase shit. That was fucked up. Oh, Yo, that if was you crazy. Guys haven't, if you guys haven't watched Black Mirror, get in on that. It is it's really good. so good. And I've told you this many times. To me, it's the true successor to the classic Twilight Zone. Which I heard... What's-His-Face was rebooting. Well, they've rebooted it before, so... It wasn't as good. They did it in, like, the... Jordan Peele. 2000s or something. Oh, but Jordan Peele's doing it? Yeah. Oh, well, then I'm in. That's what I was saying, like... (laughs) Nice. I love Jordan Peele. You said you were gonna... Even though you don't watch horror movies, you're gonna come and watch... Us, with um, me and my mom, right? Excuse me, I'm there for Lupita. Oh, that's right, because Lupita Nyong is in it. And I you will like, see any I, movie with Lupita Nyong. I saw the trailer and I was like, oh, God, <laughs> I have to go see it. <laughs> oh, did you want to do your sources? Um, yes. I got an article from Scientific American, a, um article from VeryWellMind.com by Kendra Sherry, and um, a Time, a little bit of Wikipedia, and a Time Magazine article um, called, hold on, I'm pulling it up right now. Mm-hmm. Dude, my computer has gotten so slow, and I don't know why. And I think, you know what, it's probably because I keep it on all the time. I don't think that would really do that. Um, what your dreams actually mean according to science. Oh, it's by um, Je- Jeffrey Kluger. Oh, cool. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, pal. Appreciate it, bro. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha, so Jeff. Um, it's, gonna about to, it's about to get a little, <laughs> a little sad okay. up in here. So things are going to take a sharp fucking left turn. Um, okay, so yeah, my, my episode's not going to be as discussion-based or uh, nearly as lighthearted. So, um, yeah, I actually, that's my first point. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a difficult two episodes. Uh, it's going to be hard because there are many, many mysteries. There is a universe of mysteries within the, my topic for this week. And also because this is very, very heavy. This su- subject matter is difficult. It's emotional. But it's, it's so important. It, it's extremely important. It's, it's so important. But I do, I do want to say at the, the outset, it's hard to talk about. I'm not part of these communities. I'm not a woman. I'm not indigenous. I do not understand these communities, right? I'm speaking as an outsider, but it's the the responsibility of people in a public setting to talk about these kinds of topics because they are not getting talked about. Yes. And that is a big part of what I'm going to talk about in this episode, but it's, it's hard. So just, let's just put it out there at the very beginning. So I'm talking about, uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And this is a big fucking topic. Like the missing children of the Argentine Dirty War, the, this mm-hmm. story, you know, of these missing and murdered indigenous women and girls throughout North America, all parts of North America, is it's just 
a huge set of mysteries. So, so many. Um, so I'm going to do it in two episodes. So in the first episode, we're going to talk basically about the who, the what, the when, right? Who these women are, what, what's been happening to them, when it's happened, that kind of stuff. Just the facts, basically, with a heavy amount of commentary. And then, then in the second episode, we're going to get into the why. And that's a huge mystery, that's, all yeah. set of mysteries, multifaceted mysteries, uh, just in and of itself. And that involve, and just I'm just going to mention a little bit, because I know it, it, the, the tendency is going to be to want to talk about that the whole time, right? But we're, it's going to involve, you know, things like, you know, legal standing issues, because you, who is the actual police force to whom you go when you live in certain areas? And are you, you're of certain communities or you're perpetrators of a certain community? And, and it's all different. And it involves things like systemic racism, you know, like the lesser dead uh, phenomenon. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about all of that stuff. Um, but we'll just keep it to kind of general factors um, when, when we're talking about the who, the what, the when. Okay, so first, um, let's talk about the who. And that's really one of the biggest mysteries of this because who these women are, why we talk specifically about indigenous women and, and girls. A lot of Jane Doe's. Well, there there are definitely, and there are a lot of known women and girls who just don't properly get investigated or properly covered in the media. And... Unfortunately, because of that, we'll never really know. We'll never really know, even in mo even among modern recent cases, uh, how many murdered and missing women and girls of the indigenous communities of North America there are. But there are a lot, and uh, it's a lot more than anyone has counted so far. And and um, one of my main sources I'm going to talk about is a study that was done to to really try to dig into this issue and uh a comprehensive way, and we'll, we'll talk about what they came uh, up with. So um, according to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, murder is the third leading cause of death of indigenous women. Oh my so that's one of the God. reasons why we talk about this. This community, the level of violence and trauma in this community is endemic and systemic and has far-reaching uh, effects on my understanding is essentially all members of this community and many members outside of the community that are, that are affected obviously as well, uh, by it. And, um, not only is, is it prevalent within the community, they're also grossly overrepresented in, in the statistics in the crime statistics to the point of, in some instances among some communities being 10 times the average, um, among certain, you know, um, communities. And the, this includes crime statistics like sexual assault, domestic violence, um, par intimate partner violence, assault, battery, murder, um, just all kinds of heinous crimes. And, the, and these stories are also, like I said before, chronically underreported. Um, 90 plus percent of them are not reported in the media. Wow. Which is maddening and... and unbelievable and, and <laughs> until you look at sources where it documents these things and they're not properly investigated in many instances. Um, and in episode two, again, we'll, we'll explore the cultural structural reasons why um, these women and girls of the indigenous communities are a textbook example of the lesser dead phenomenon. So the question of who, how many indigenous women have gone missing or, or murdered is, like I said, exceedingly difficult to answer. Um, one of my main sources was the, uh, a, a report from the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is a division of the Seattle Indi Indian Health Board, which attempts to f it has attempted to fill in some of these gaps. And we'll begin by kind of reviewing their findings, and, and we'll also discuss some of the reasons why there are gaps that still remain, e even after their, their diligent work. Um, so with one of the blind spots, and th this is definitely a blind spot that I had coming into this, mm -hmm. that the UIHI investigators and epidemiolo epidemiologists were trying to point out is that of urban dwelling indigenous peoples. 
um, especially in, in, in uh, the United States, but among, you know, Alaska Natives and, and the First Peoples of Canada as well. According to the report, 71% of American Indians or Alaska Natives live in urban areas. Okay. The vast majority. They don't mostly live on reservations or in rural areas. They are mostly city del- dwellers, like mm-hmm. the rest of us. <laughs> like the majority of Americans in general, they live in cities. They're normal people, <laughs> you know. Um, but we, we forget that. We, we think about them as being these people who still are, you know, um, bounded by the constraints that our government tried to put on them throughout all of those years. They've, you know, been able to break out of that to some extent, but, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated picture. It's a more complicated picture than I knew about beforehand, certainly. And these people's, you know, existence and experiences tend to really get obscured. Um, especially, especially in the urban areas as most people in the public and, and law enforcement and media have a, you know, this kind of different picture of them. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of get more into this lack of, institutional data and, and how this creates mysteries, right? This is what, what I like to call, like, th- these are official mysteries because they're a consequence of official action or inaction. Oh, if, if, okay. If people in law enforcement, in media, in government were doing what they should be doing, yes. these mysteries for the most right. part, would not exist. It's the fumbled cases. It's the bad police work. And that's right. ca- type of mysteries. Mm-hmm. Like, it's exactly why it's a cold case, because right. nobody did their job. Mm-hmm. These are, these are man-made mysteries. It's the most mysteries. frustrating type, too. Yes. It's so frustrating. And not everyone. Not every investigator, not every police force, not every person in government um, or in a, in a position of responsibility in these situations. But a lot. Way too many. Too many. Way too Way many. Way too many. Um, but but we don't want to also paint with too broad of a of a brush. Um, so, yeah, um, the the UIHI report identified uh, five hundred and six um, cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, mainly since um, twenty. Well, mainly since two thousand, but a, a good chunk of it was. Since 2010. Oh, my God. Um, 153 of these were not in official police records. Were not? Were not in any official wow. police records. Um, and d- due to the limitations of data collection, um, limited funds, you know, things of that nature, they, they know this to be an undercount. Perhaps a severe undercount. Um, furthermore, this is only a count in the United States. Right. And it, it focused on urban um, ind- indigenous people. And the, it, it affected um, women and girls of, of various groups, uh, cisgendered women, transgender women, two-spirit individuals, um, which are members of certain North American indigenous peoples who don't, don't fit a binary male-female gender rubric and sometimes fill a particular role in their society. Um, their cases span decades. Um However, due to the limitations, like I was talking about, you know, mo- these are mostly from the last 15 years. The oldest case identified was from 1943, and two-thirds of them actually are since 2010. Oh, my God. Now that I'm, I'm getting to that part of my write-up, yeah. Well, I guess... I... That's since digitization has come in. Right, that's, right. That's, that's what the I'm reason. saying. That's the only reason. Yeah. Because they, they're able to search There's the more files. more technology. But... We'll talk about in episode two how that is not a silver bullet, and there are many issues that arise in that scenario as well, but we'll, we'll get into that later. The, um, these women and girls come from every region of the, of the United, uh, continental United States, Alaska, and Canada. Um, the UIH report focused on 71 cities in 29 states. These were cities that had the largest indigenous communities, um, or the largest affected populations of uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, The largest number were in the Southwest, the Pacific Northwest, California, um, as well as the cities of Seattle, Albuquerque, and Anchorage. Mm -hmm. So these are dispersed um, in in a pretty wide area, and they're not necessarily focused in the plains or, you know, the upper you know, um, uh, like uh, Montana or something, Th- these women and girls live everywhere. 
Um, they are part of all of our communities. Um, so, yeah, the, the youngest victim was one year old. What? And the oldest was like, 83, under a year. Like, murdered? It didn't or say, missing? but I'm assuming murdered. Yeah, like I said, this is a tough, tough set of episodes. It's rough. This is That's a very it's up. very emotional. We're 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 both holding back the tears. It's so um, up. the mean age was twenty nine. But it, again, we, we have to talk about these things. We we have to like power through it. Um a minority were victims of domestic or intimate partner violence, about eight percent. I think that's also a misperception that, yeah. you know, the majority of these cases somehow come from uh, domestic partner violence. That's not the case. And a lot of it is that people don't talk. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of bystander effect, like, oh, I thought you were going to say something, even if people wanted to say something. Yeah. And now that you and say that. There's a lot I'll, of disconnect yeah. between indigenous people and the police anyway. Oh, definitely, yeah, and yeah, we'll 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 get into some more of that stuff next week too. But just in general, yes, there is a very much a reluctance among some communities to go to the police to know which police department to go to. Murder cases are generally handled by the FBI, even if they occur on tribal lands. Um, and we'll talk about how they're sovereign nations in the next episode. Sometimes, if it's not clear whether they were murdered or if they ran away or if they're truly missing, the local indigenous community police will not necessarily intervene. And the FBI certainly won't take a look at that because there's no real crime there. So yeah. it, it's just hard. People are left with a kind of sense that no one's looking out for them and, and they're kind of right. That's what's really sad about it. Um, so yeah, um, just a, a little more of statistics. Uh, 25% were missing persons, 56% were murders, and oh, 19% wow. were unknown. Because they're in certain systems, if someone is missing, they're simply taken off the missing list. Whether they were murdered, whether they came home safe, whatever happened, they're just simply taken off the list without any okay. other indication. So there are people that were taken off the list, but are still, their family members are saying that they don't, they haven't seen them or they don't know? The investigators of the UIHI don't know. Their family members very well may know, but it's impossible now to find out because, you know, they couldn't track them down or they didn't have the time or the resources. So, it, you know, it, it remains a mystery. One of the many, 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 many mysteries within this, um, which, again, is partly an official mystery. Um, the victims had a large number of tribal affiliations, um, including tribes and I didn't really know about this before, that are not officially recognized by the United States. Mm. And they were saying that actually the tribe that uh, originally occupied the land that Los Angeles is at right now is not actually officially recognized by the United States, mm. which I thought was, was interesting. Um, and I have no idea why. Um, and while, but that's probably not good. Um, I, I, I would say, I'm not giving them the <laughs> benefit of the doubt in that scenario, uh, United States government. Um, so while some perpetrators have been identified, many, many of these cases have gone unsolved. And obviously the missing cases are unsolved. But many, many, many of the murders have gone unsolved. Far, far too many. And one of the most famous sets of missing persons and murders, um, sort of a, a galaxy of mysteries within this larger universe of mysteries, is known as the Highway of Tears. Mm which has its own Wikipedia page, documentaries about it. It's exceedingly famous. It's um, terrible. Exceedingly tragic. And, and like some of the other mysteries we've covered, like the B1 Butcher, the Texas Killing Fields, for example, there is a concentration of murders and missing persons along Highway 16. Yep. Yeah, the Highway 16 corridor between Prince Rupert and Prince George in British Columbia, Canada. And there are somewhere between 18 to maybe as many as 40 or more of these cases. Kind of depends on how you count. The EPANA, they call it, um, database that these uh, Canadian um, mounted, whatever, Royal Mounted Police or whatever, they've identified 18. But they exclude some cases that are within a few miles of the highway or, you know, seem to be connected to it, but... They weren't literally found still, along the highway. 18 or is still. 18, 18 is still too way too many. many. <laughs> and it's since 1970, 1970 to present. And, you know, these are wow. almost entirely women, I believe. 
and almost entirely young women and indigenous women are way overrepresented in the set um, amongst these victims. And like the Texas killing fields, this area is extremely remote, um, which is probably part of why this occurs. And it's um, with many, many convenient places to dispose of a body and carrion birds and, and other things that will take away a body, apparently. Yeah. I read that in a source. But also I read and heard that part of the reason why this happens is because there's not a proper public transport system that's affordable to the people who live there. So they're forced to <gasps> hitchhike. Oh my and God. And of course, hitchhiking is extremely, extremely dangerous. Correlated with, with uh, being a victim of violence, right? Of course. So, you know, it, not to victim blame, but um, to understand the context, you know, of, yeah. what, of why these, again, why these mysteries uh, arise. Um, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, like I said, have that database, but you know, it's pretty restrictive. There are probably more than the 18 that they identify. And three serial, serial killers have been linked um, to the crimes, uh, but only one has ever, I believe, been uh, actually convicted of any of these murders. And for the rest of them, you know, obviously there's no justice at all. There's, there's nothing. Uh, no resolution for the families or anything. Um, so another of my sources, um, which was actually a podcast series, uh, eight-part podcast series. This is what I was doing on Sunday. Nice. <laughs> this was my Sunday. Uh, about seven hours or so I listened to. Uh, it was really, really good, actually. I, the, there was a reason I kept listening to it, too. Um, it was called Missing and Murdered, Who Killed Alberta Williams? Um, by the CBC reporter, Canadian broadcast company reporter, Connie Walker. Um, who did a really, really great job with this and all of her, her team. Um, and it details one unsolved case of a murdered First Nation woman. And that just tells you about these mysteries, this set of mysteries. Like, there's no possible... I'd have to, I, I'd have to do a 100-hour podcast episode to really do this right, justice. Right, Just understand that I'm doing two episodes, but I could do 50 times more. Um, one case was given a seven-hour podcast. One case. Yeah. And I would encourage you to go listen to this, uh, Missing and Murdered, Who Killed Alberta Williams, because it's it's a, a very interesting story and, and tragic, very tragic. Um, I feel like th this could be its own podcast uh, in it of itself. Oh, like yeah. its own podcast topic. Definitely. There could definitely be a whole podcast just about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. But we're not going to do it because... We don't have the expertise, and um, we do mysteries. If someone were to do it, it should be... It should be someone with more... Yeah. And somebody... Who could do it justice. Uh, indigenous. True. Which, um, I should say, Connie Walker is. She, she is a, okay. mem a member of an indigenous community okay. herself, and, and grew up in one. Um, okay, so her um, series, her investigative series, picked up an old case from 1989, 27 years later, so it's 2016. And dramatically, one of the lead investigators in that case, the case of Alberta Williams, who's long since retired, emailed Connie Walker with a one-sentence email. And the subject... Am I going to like this or not? Yeah, no, you're, you're going to okay. like it. <laughs> the, 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 the subject of it was, um, I know who killed... Alberta Williams. And the only sentence in the email was, it is name. And they didn't actually release the name until about four episodes in. And in case you are going to listen to it, I won't like give away everything. I'm going to kind of go through the case, but there's lots, lots more that they get into, in, in, including that. Cause I don't I really listen to get to into that too much. It's yeah, you should um, for sure. I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, okay. So that retired officer um, was, was really haunted like a lot of people in a lot of these cases, yeah. by Alberta's murder. And, and, and I just want to, like, emphasize that as much as I can, the emotional and, and, and traumatic impact that these cases, these mysteries have had on so many people. Um, and the retired officer felt compelled all these decades later to speak up, to say what he thought he knew to respark the investigation. Which it ended up doing, actually. This yeah. this podcast ended up bringing more attention to this case when, why didn't it have that attention before? But anyway, that's a question well, that they ask also. tend to have that power. It's true. That's why people in the media need to talk about these things. But anyway, that's what we're talking about. Anyway. 
Anyway. Anyway, anyway. So at first, um, you know, she and her colleagues, Connie and her co- colleagues, think, okay, we're just going to do kind of a regular, you know, radio TV piece for this. It's very interesting. We definitely want to do it. But, you know, it's going to be a, a, a hit, a piece. However, once they actually start looking into it, they realize, no, there is way too much to this. This needs to be wow. a whole thing, right? Yeah. We, need, we need to really make a, a If we're going to do this, we're going to do this. this. Right, right, right. Yeah. And the, the, Connie, the CBC reporter, talks to police, family, witnesses, suspects, uncovers stories and evidence that the police never got from 30 years ago uh, or so. Um, they... You know, the CBC reporters navigate a complex set of, does, you know, cousins, rumors, um, in, intrigue, all this stuff to try to uncover the truth. However, even the basic facts, like whether a certain party occurred on a certain night or whether a mysterious white blonde guy with a black truck actually existed or not. Yeah. Or it was just a made up story. They don't. They don't definitively necessarily answer these questions. And I don't think you'll ever know. Will you it's ever so know? hard. Twenty-seven years later, it's so so hard. But during the course of her investigation, family members implicate each other, or some of them stubbornly refuse to talk at all. Just like they refuse to, for example, give DNA evidence at the time, which is mm. fishy. And it more than one person involved did that. <laughs> Um, old police records that they looked through were incomplete, but they pointed to some as yet uncovered leads that they tried to continue to go down. And there was also, um, the, yes, in, in some of those incomplete, uh, police records, there were, there were like, I don't know, I, I just thought this was, was an, an interesting little tidbit these like little booklets, dozens and dozens of these little booklets that the officer would write in. Mm-hmm. But apparently his handwriting was so bad <gasps> that literally only he could read it. So he had to sit there being like, I think I wrote this and this. Oh and, my God. Uh, and some of it, even he wasn't able to read. And all the cases were interspersed together from day to day. That is so, that is infuriating. Just to give you an idea of what it takes to investigate one of these mysteries, oh right? God. 27 years later. Not the, be- not, the, not the best setup to investigate a Jesus. crime, right? Um, anyway. So, by the Connie and her colleagues continuing to push for interviews, the CBC reporter was eventually able to learn um, that Alberta was probably seen in a black truck with two or three men on the night of the crime. So she kind of was able to kind of establish that at least, which the police were never able to do at the time. And additionally, a relative describes a harrowing phone call in which an anonymous woman told her, that the relative, that Alberta had been murdered and where to find the body. What the fuck? This was before they knew she was murdered. So clearly there's someone out there who knew and presumably wasn't the killer. So, like, it's out there. Like, someone knows something. That's always the case. Someone <sighs> always knows something. And that, mm, uh, oh, which, this which whole of course thing is, is a, like, so, yeah. must want to tear my fucking hair out. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a frustrating, like I said, it's going to be a difficult two episodes. Um, the CBC uh, reporter sur- also surreptitiously connect, uh, collected DNA evidence from a possible suspect, which is interesting. Um, I'll, le- I'll You have to listen to the podcast to know whether anything came of that or not. But, you know, despite, like I said at the beginning, despite this new evidence, the uncovered memories, the CBC investigators are, quote, um, left with more questions than answers, unquote. Which, again, is, is so much always the case which with all of these things for the most part. And the police maintain to this day that it's an open investigation, so they can't talk too much about it, mm. you know. But, yes, it was given new life partly due to the podcast. Like, specifically, like, investigators said that. So, you know, Alberta's story remains a mystery, and it continues to haunt investigators, community members, family members, you know, everyone who's left behind. 
I'm glad that's all you have to say about it because I really want to watch it. Yeah, yeah. That, or, no, um, I, I, really I, I didn't really want to listen to I it. I didn't want to give away too much, um, but yeah, definitely check it out. But it, it, it was kind of one of my main sources, so I wanted to, you know, use it. Um, and, you know, many of these cases, like I said, continued to have a severe impact on the communities where where they occurred, um, whether these were very recently, like there were some, you know, that were very recent, like the, the last one I'm going to talk about, or many, many decades ago. And the number um, of mysteries that, that, that remain of, of, of this type, it, it just, it leads to this and contributes to this sense of hopelessness, the sense of injustice that surrounds these, these tragedies that just magnifies that natural tragedy of losing a loved one. Yeah. Not only did you lose someone in the sense that they were taken from you or murdered, but some of my sources um, described it as losing them three times. They're lost to the crime, they're lost in, to the police, and they're lost in the media. So they die three times, not once, three times. That's a terrible, terrible... Yeah. perspective. That's the kind of pessimistic attitude you get when you're a part of a community that is uh, chronically and severely under uh, served in the law enforcement community. You know, like if you don't get justice or at least the truth, you get angry and you get sad and you don't understand why this is happening. Yeah. And like the last case that I'm going to talk about, sometimes you just continue to do any thing you can um, so I, I, I just wanted to, talk to and, and I know we're, we're getting over almost an hour here, but, um, I just want to talk about one more. Um, so Ashley heavy runner Loring was 20 years old when she was last seen on June 8th, 2017. Oh, wow. She was a baby. Yeah. Just about a year and a half ago. And her sister, Kimberly, the older sister has led a constant search for her ever since between June, 2017 and September of 2018, which was when my source was from, they had made about 40 searches, four zero searches. Wow. Kimberly told the AP, quote, I'm the older sister. I need to do this. I don't want to search until I'm 80, but if I have to, I will. Oh, my Close God. Close quote. Which reminds me of so many of the courageous victims and victims' family and, and community that, that we've talked about, right? Like yeah. the, you know, 43 missing from the Ayotzinapa school their family members going out into the Relentless. desert and finding uh, finding other people's yeah. family members who would, had been buried out there. I mean, and so many, you know. But but yes, this relentlessness. Um, it's 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 tragic, but in an inspiring way. Right. It's right. it's a complex mix. It gives emotions. you hope. It, it, yes, in a sense. Um, so during those searches, she, community members, extended family, have gone through snake-filled fields, muddy bogs, over mountains, in snow, in rain, cold and heat. And like many of the victims' family members um, of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, Kimberly felt that it was her duty to fill the traditional role of an investigator or a law enforcement officer since those official parties seemingly abnegated their responsibilities. Yeah, wow. Fuck that. Right. Yeah. Fuck people who don't investigate properly. On these long, lonely searches, Kimberly and her family call out to Ashley, quote, in different directions, the repetition four times by each woman is a ritual designed to beckon someone's spirit, close quote. Oh, wow. So it's a spirit. It's very... It's a, it's it's ritualistic yeah. to her, yeah. and 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 in her tradition, I suppose. I mean, although I don't really know, like I said, I'm an outsider. You, you but do what you need to do. Exactly. That's what I said. Like anything you can, um, you search, you dig, you read. You can't sit. You you look at pictures and read about things that you cannot imagine. Yeah. You know that that twist you inside. Right. But you do it because. You have to get justice. You have to yeah. get the truth. Yeah. Wait, when? When was this? This was, you said this, this was like September or, or um, 2017? Yeah, she went missing in June of 2017. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it hasn't even been that long. So Kimberly and her other family members also participated um, 
I probably more than once, I'd imagine, in one of the many memorial marches yeah. that are held in North America for the missing and murdered indigenous women. Yes, girls. I've I've seen pictures from these. Yeah, and I just it's wanted incredible. to kind of go incredible. Yeah, definitely. It's incredible. Um I mean to yeah, talk about at least giving you some hope that someone is coming together for these women. Yeah. Even even if just their communities. Yeah. And it's another know? like wave of, of, of awareness. Exactly. And, and, like, getting the word out there. Exactly. So I kind of wanted to, to just run through some of those um, to highlight them. So um, the annual North American Indian Days in Browning, Montana, that was the particular one that they walked at. Okay. Um, they held a red banner, which um, in uh, certain indigenous traditions is known as the only color that the spirits can see. So oh, it's a, wow. it has significance. Um, and they wore T-shirts that read, we will never give up. Okay. Which again is that's just the pure message, right? Yeah. Um, oh wow. Many others uh, are attempting, of course, to bring the issue up, um, although not nearly enough. Um, in the U.S., there's a bill called Savannah's Act. Uh huh. Um, I think it was sponsored mainly by Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota, um, the senator, and it attempts to improve data collection. Um, th- it has its own issues, but it will make things better. Yeah. Um, and it's wending its way through the legislature. Who knows? We'll see. I don't have a lot of faith in our Congress, but we'll see. There is an ongoing official commission in Canada that was supposed to wrap at the end of 2018, but which will, uh, I believe, get extended since it's got a lot of more work to do. And it's got its own issues, but um, again, it's trying to do work uh, on this issue. Uh, May 5th is actually the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls in the U.S., so if you're looking for a day to do something or say something Donate about some this, money, do, put out a little, put out, put out the word, right? Whatever you can talk to people. May fifth apparently is the day, um, or or any other day, every every other day, I guess. Um, the Native Women's Association of Canada has done a lot of advocacy work that I read about, and I'm sure a lot more, um, including helping to create a database of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls with uh, some other organizations, including Families of Sisters in Spirit and No More Silence. An annual Women's Memorial March has been held, I believe, since 1991 in Vancouver. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, starting in response to the murder of a particular Coast Salish woman. Uh, And, of course, we we talked about the Salish Sea, you know, way back when, when we talked about the the severed feet, you know, uh, there and, and of course, in the Pacific Northwest, Uh, which, of course, there was just another one the other day. This is so crazy. Right. Uh, not to get on too, on too much of a tangent. Uh, memorials uh, also include Sisters in Spirit Vigils, the Red Dress Project, Walking with Our Sisters, Faceless Dolls Project, and Female Inukshut, uh, which are uh, Karens. Um, despite all of this advocacy, you know, and these, these good works by all these people, like we said at the beginning, the, the this issue, the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, is chronically undercovered. It's far from. It's, it's far from where it needs to be. It doesn't make any sense. When people go missing, when people get murdered, there should be something. There for every one, every person, is it right? Or am I wrong? Is that not something we all agree on? No, I don't know. Correct. I know you it's, agree. It's it just it makes me be, frustrated. It's something that should be common sense, but... It's not. And there's an assumption that it is. I think that's also part of it, right? By well-intentioned right, people right, who, who right. simply have never taken the time, like me, like, but like I'm talking about myself here as well, who have never taken the time to understand that this is an underrepresented issue. And then when you do, you get mad as hell. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. what the fuck was I thinking all these years? Right. No, the 90 plus percent of these women's cases go under, un, uh, go, all, if not uh, not reported at all, chronically underreported. And it uh, it's a big part of the issue. Just the, the, and we were talking about it earlier, if you don't define an issue, you can't solve it. You know, and that was in one of the main points that the UIHI report made as well. If you don't know what the issue is, you don't know it's an issue. So you have to do the work to collect the data to know what the issue is before we can solve the issue. Right. And I think we should all agree that missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is an issue. It's a big fucking issue. Any set of victims is an issue, but this set of victims is overrepresented. This set of victims has a higher prevalence. So 
we need to do work on right. this issue. It's the same. It's the same idea as 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 Black Lives Matter. Like exactly. of course, of course, of, of course, course, all, all lives, lives matter. matter. But. That's not what we're focusing right. on right now. That's but not what we li- need to focus but on. whose lives because- are in peril. Exactly, exactly. Right? Right. That's the question. I feel like the best, the best um, like, imagery for this is like, oh my God, my house is on fire. Well, what about my house? <laughs> right. <laughs> my house all, could catch on fire any moment. All houses matter, but mine is burning to the ground right. at the moment. It's, it's what you so, call a oh re- reductio ad absurdum. Um, What's it called? Reductio ad absurdum. If you make an argument and someone else can take that same argument and phrase it in such a way that it sounds completely goddamn ridiculous, <laughs> then it's not a good argument. <laughs> That's reductio ad absurdum. I learned that in a philosophy class. Oh, wow. Thank you, college. Thank you very much, college. Oh, my God. I, I learned just, something. I had the worst philosophy. I'm so jealous. You had a great Buddhism philosophy class. Oh, I love that Buddhism class. My philosophy class was terrible. I've had a lot of good religion Todd, classes. Okay. Worst teacher. I do have to get to rehearsal, so let's wrap pretty quick here. So I'm going to go through my sources. Um, of course, and that, this is this is um, a a to be continued oh, on yes. on both of our parts. Yes, yes, yes. Right, we're doing right. we're doing the rare two separate two parters, and we'll do um, we'll cover weird news at the end of the next episode. Let's. Um, but I did want to – let's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. very good, very good. Um, but I did want to do my sources. So the UIHI report, um, which is titled Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, read it. Please read it. It's 32 pages. It's got a lot of graphics. 32 pages? It's not, it's not a full 32 pages of text. That was sarcasm. <laughs> sarcasm. Look it up. Read it. Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, UIHI report. Um, Wikipedia, of course, the MMIW page, the Highway of Tears page, among others, the CBC podcast I had mentioned earlier by Connie Walker, Connie Walker and Natanis Piopot at um, CBC, uh, Maureen Halishok at Flair, Manisha Krishnan at Vice, Sharon Cohen at AP, Camilla Dominasek at uh, NPR, and the editorial board of St. Cloud Times. Those are my sources. And I'll, right. I will, I'm sure, have some more next time. Uh, okay. Team mystery. Yeah. Go team mystery. Okay, we should be, I really have to go. It's time to go. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye.